Good morning, everybody. Uh, my name is Brenda Schladweiler. I'm with uh, BKS Environmental, and I'm part of the planning committee for the North Dakota Reclamation Conference. This year, we are presenting five uh, webinars in a series throughout March, and the first of them is today. Um, I have some housekeeping uh, things I need to mention at first. Uh, the webinars will be recorded and will be available at that uh, website that's shown on this intro slide. Uh, you can use the chat to discuss ideas amongst uh, participants. Uh, please remember to uh, select either the panelist you are wanting to talk to or all participants. And if you uh, will, just to get us going this morning, uh, it would be good to add where you're from in the chat to everyone. And that way we can uh, kind of see where everybody's uh, coming in from. Uh, use the Q&A to ask a question, and we'll answer it live, but we'll hold all those until the end. And just a reminder, the next webinar series will be next uh, Wednesday at the same time, uh, and that uh, webinar series will be on pipeline reclamation. So next slide. This is the obligatory non-discrimination statement. Um, We'll, we'll proceed to the next slide. Okay, so with today's speakers, um, I had the pleasure of listening to these ladies a couple weeks ago at the Society for Range Management uh, Restoration and Reclamation uh, Committee uh, seminar. Um, and that was a virtual presentation. And also, they did a great job and I'm looking forward to uh, listening to them again as I'm probably sure I missed a lot. So with that, I will introduce the first speaker. These guys will do a tag team approach to this presentation. And it worked really well a couple of weeks ago. So that's what we're gonna to do today. So with that, uh, Dr. Ann McIntosh uh, is an associate professor at the Augustana campus of the University of Alberta. She has been conducting ecological plant community and soils research for over 20 years in diverse ecosystems in the Northern hemisphere. Her research focuses on recovery of forested and grassland ecosystems after both natural and anthropogenic disturbance. She received her BSc in honors from the University of British Columbia, her MSc in forest science from Oregon State University, and her PhD in forest biology and management from the University of Alberta in 2013. She is the lead ecologist on a project focused on monitoring recovery of reclaimed well sites in Alberta that she will be presenting on today. Tracy Kapchenko is the second speaker um, interlaced with uh, Anne's uh, discussions as well. Tracy achieved a degree in agriculture from the University of Alberta in 2000. Throughout her 20 year career, she has had uh, the opportunity to work for various regulatory agencies in Alberta in both grazing management and reclamation capacities, focusing on the grassland region of the province. For the past seven years, Tracy has worked for the Alberta Energy Regulator as the subject matter expert for grasslands and as an assessor with the oil and gas reclamation group. In addition to day-to-day -day work, she's an active member of the Society for Range Management Southern Alberta Youth Range Days, Grassland Restoration Forum, and Prairie Conservation Forum. Tracy will be sharing her observations and experience as a professional who has had the opportunity to work in various regulatory roles related to activities on southeastern Alberta's grasslands. This presentation will be based completely on her experiences and professional opinions. Both of them today will be talking about the Alberta grasslands perspective on reclamation. And with that, Anne, you may begin. Perfect, thank you, Brenda. I wanna begin by acknowledging that I'm on Treaty 6 territory, a traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples, including the Musquachis Nahiwak, Nitsitapi, Nakoda and Satina nations, the Métis and other indigenous peoples. My research sites and where Tracy is in Alberta is located in Treaty 7, also a traditional meeting ground for many indigenous peoples, including the Kainai Blood, Siksika Blackfoot, Pakani Pagan, Stony Nakoda, and Sutina. Uh, 
Um, and so I'm happy to be here. And Tracy is going to take the lead in terms of the, the first part of this presentation. Then you'll hear from me and then we'll go back and forth after that. So look forward to presenting to you. Thank you. Thanks, Anne. And thank you, Brenda, for the nice introduction. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm coming to you live from Medicine Hat, Alberta, which is in the southeast corner of the province, about 60 miles north of the U.S. border. I was asked to speak last year, at which time I was working with the AER, but I've since altered my career path and work elsewhere right now. Therefore, I just want to be clear that I am presenting today on the information that is based on just my experience and my personal professional opinion. So I just want to make that very clear. As you can see the map here, just for those folks that haven't been up here before, we have um, the map on the left is uh, quite self-explanatory. And the map on the right is Alberta in the red and Texas on in blue, superimposed or purple. So just to give you some context, Alberta is a pretty large area and it goes from the tundra and boreal forests in the north to cultivated farmland throughout the province and down to the grasslands in the southeast and southern portion of the province, which is where we'll be speaking about today. So as we mentioned already, um, there, I just wanted to mention there's five natural subregions of the grasslands in Alberta, which is the map on the left. The map on the green, on the right, sorry, it shows the remaining intact grasslands or rangelands or prairie, whichever word you want to use. And that is the parts that are in green. Just to give you some idea of where we'll be speaking from. And Medicine Hat is right here in the southeast corner. That's where I'm coming to you from. So in Alberta, there are like I mentioned, all of the different regions. Next, Anne, please. Um, the photos are pump jacks of different oil sites from the north through to the south. Um, there is drilling throughout the province. The map on the right looks really busy, but just to note, it's not to scale since we can't zoom into each well site on the map, but each black dot is essentially a well that was drilled at some point in Alberta forever and a day since 1883. And this includes natural gas wells, oil wells, CBM wells, oil sands exploration wells, in situ coal exploration, water injection, inert gases. So the whole gamut. And fun fact, the first natural gas well drilled in Alberta in 1883 is located just 20 miles west of where I'm sitting here today. So just a, it's, it's, we've been doing a little bit of drilling in Alberta for a while. <laughs> Next. Um, the map, this, this, I guess, graph is dated, we acknowledge that, but it shows you the economic kind of the different um, stages of well site uh, in their life cycle. The, the thing I wanted to point out is that since 2017, due to the economic downturn, particularly in natural gas markets in recent years, there's been a significant increase in the reclaimed and certified well sites, which is the green area here, and since 2017, and a decrease in the active sites, which is the blue. So that if we had a 2020 graph updated, it would look it would look quite a bit different. Next. So today we are talking about reclamation. Reclamation in Alberta is legislated. It is a requirement. For the purposes of this presentation and to be consistent with my co-presenters project, I'll be focusing my examples on well sites located on provincial public lands. So there are federal lands, there is private lands, and there's public lands. The RECSER criteria pertains to all land ownership in Alberta except federal lands. And the RECSER criteria is a rule book for industry to follow. So the purpose of the reclamation certificate is to document that industry has met all the requirements and can confirm that the site has met, met all the applicable regulations. It essentially is the end goal. Next. Now, it has been an evolution to the regulatory approach throughout um, the years. Initially, pre-1989, I guess 1993, and protect the soils and just get something growing on it again. Science and reclamation regulations have evolved in conjunction with construction practices occurring on the landscape. So everything from the type of equipment through to when and how things are built has 
has been also evolving. And so it has been a continuous improvement throughout the years. The current criteria, so 2010 is the current criteria, it has a greater emphasis on the ecological functioning of, of the area of the site and matching the adjacent offsite plant community while utilizing science-based information and tools. So you'll see that with that evolution, there's still things that are, are coming, it, hopefully down the pipe because 2010 is now 11 years old. So we'll be discussing the 2010 current criteria in more detail. This table that you're looking at right now is table two from the 2010 criteria for grasslands. It is a very busy table. <laughs> There's a lot of if this and that. There, so there is a lot of information, but the reason I'm showing you this table is to show you that this, it is, it's a simplification of an extensive in-depth process utilized by the reclamation practitioner or the environmental consultant, whichever word you wanna use, to determine which process applies based on the vintage of the site. So it's a decision tree based on site-specific information, such as the construction and reclamation timeline to determine the minimum reclamation requirements that apply for landscape, soils, and vegetation. Each site has a unique story. So it really is essentially, it's kind of a, if this, then that scenario. And if you remember those old books that we used to have, choose your own adventure books, it's kind of like that where if, you know, your site was built pre-93 and it was on grasslands and it had this type of construction practice, blah, blah, blah. So you have to follow the steps. And that is kind of really like choose your own adventure. So that's part of the rec cert criteria, which is very detailed. And if you can see me, it fills up a three inch binder, which I keep on my desk and it's definitely a reference. So it's a monster, <laughs> but let's do a little bit of a uh, walk through a little bit of history lesson here. Pre-93, so in the 80s to 1993, based on the knowledge at the time in the 80s, the government of Alberta recommended seeding of crested wheatgrass onto industrial sites on public grazing lands or grazing leases. Now, over time, we realized that those decisions had unintended consequences. This area in the photo that you see is in the dry mixed grass subregion, which is near Medicine Hat. This area, the dry mix grass, is predominantly cold season native grasses, which are best utilized after, well, generally speaking, after June 1st of each year for grazing. And as you may know or not, crested wheatgrass is an early season tame grass species that is known to begin growing even under the spring snows. So it's very useful grass in providing early season grazing and deferring the use of native range pastures. However, once crested wheatgrass sets seed, it's not preferred by cattle in comparison to native grass seed, uh, species. Sorry, The mixing of these two grasses, as you can see in the line here, the pipeline that was seeded to, crest, to crested wheatgrass is quite visible uh, in amongst the native prairie. And the mixing of these two grass species essentially created an oil and water scenario for range managers. So if this pasture is used later in the season to benefit the native grasses, the crested wheatgrass is not utilized and therefore gets stronger and spreads. And I just, I haven't figured out how to train a cow to graze just a strip of grass, just straight down the pipeline and not touch the grass, the native grass is off site. Haven't figured that out yet. But what does remain is a visible scar on the landscape. Obviously you can see that. In which the reclaimed area does not match the adjacent plant community. Plus there's a soil seed bank grow, um, from years of growth so we're talking 40 years now of seed bank in that soil trying to get rid of that seed grass of that crusty wheatgrass now is is next to impossible the the um, one thing that i wanted to point out is that once these unintended consequences are recognized the government of alberta now prohibits the use of crusty wheatgrass and similar agronomic species for reclamation on provincial public lands so that's one example of of whoops, we shouldn't have done that, now what? So now it's there, we can't get rid of it. Since 1993, um, or in 1993, there was the concept of equivalent land capability that came about. You can see the definition there, I won't read it to you. The legislation that governs the reclamation criteria, so I meant, I meant to mention that earlier, the reclamation in Alberta is legislated, it is mandatory, so it, is under the Alberta's Environmental Protection and Enhancement Act, or APEA, 
then under APIA, it has this equivalent land capability. And it regards all industrial upstream oil and gas. But it does recognize that all, not all land uses are identical. So the end of that definition, but individual land uses are not necessarily identical is, is really important to remember. Next. In 1995, a new reclamation criteria or a reclamation criteria was developed with new intents. So using ELC, equivalent land capability, it recognizes di recognize the different land uses. So it has criteria for cultivated lands, has criteria for forested lands, has different criteria for grasslands because they're different ecosystems. And now recently we even have a peatland criteria. Rec and it recognizes the need for consistent assessment approach and that the controls to comparisons had to be adjacent to the site, not a mile or two miles away. Uh, the, the other thing to mention is that Alberta's, I'll just say that Re Alberta's reclamation criteria driven by ELC has evolved and shows the evolution of reclamation as a science. So in 1995, rec reclamation at the time focused on conserving soil, typically through stripping of the soil or pushing the soils, stabilizing the land, preventing erosion and weeds. This, um, in 1995, the criteria of the regulation identified the importance of the physical, chemical, and biological aspects of the land through a detailed site assessment, or DSA, which includes observations and record keeping for topography, drainage, hydrology, soils, of vegetation, and their qualities that can be observed or measured in the site without a whole bunch of equipment. The, like I mentioned, the controls are adjacent to the site. And then one thing to mention in on public, public lands or on grazing lands, um, provincially held grazing lands in Alberta, the seeding on crown lands at the time utilized native cultivars, which focused on biomass production rather than biodiversity and matching the offsite species. So that was the, that was the drive in 1995. They were good goals, but as the science and construction practices progressed over the years, the goals did too. So based on the table, that table two that we looked at earlier, um, the sites that Anne and I would be talking about, that sorry, the sites that Anne will be talking about in her project would fall into this regulatory time frame of 1993 to 2010, if you refer back to that uh, table two. So therefore the sites would not qualify to be assessed under the most current 2010 criteria, which I'll discuss in more depth after Anne talks to you about her project. Go ahead, Anne. Thanks, Tracy. <clears throat> yeah, so today I'm here to talk to you about the e Ecological Recovery Monitoring Project or the ERM project. This is a project that dates back to 2012 is when I became involved in it and it, it predates, uh, predates my involvement as well. And this is a project that's really interested in addressing what becomes of sites once they receive that reclamation certificate. So there's this knowledge gap in terms of excuse me, <clears throat> when, when does a site actually go back to being equivalent land capability or having recovered as the terminology we tend to use in, uh, in the ecology, from the ecology perspective in the ERM project. So I just wanna um, premise this by saying this was uh, initiated by Arnold Jans at the government of Alberta, who is a long-term practitioner uh, and policy person and we're doing all sorts of great monitoring and uh, was really the drive, the driver behind this project. So he reached out to the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute in 2012 and said, we need to figure out what's going on with these, with these sites after they receive the reclamation certificate. So that's the, where the project that I um, uh, am going to talk about comes in. And what we're trying to do is to address the gaps that exist in terms of our knowledge related to what happens after a certificate is received. So we answered questions like what indicators should we measure? Uh, we were interested in soil, soil indicators, vegetation indicators, uh, potentially exploring other uh, components as well. Looking back essentially to see because there wouldn't have been enough time period by the time this project was initiated to follow sites over time for the most recent criteria that were established in 2010. And Tracy's gonna talk about those after I talk about my project. So we were interested in looking at the eff effectiveness of these historic reclamation practices. Are there legacy effects? Is there arrested succession? Or are they on a trajectory back to being what they were, a positive successional trajectory, if you will? Uh, and how long, if they are on a positive successional trajectory, how long does it take for them to be recovered or returned to equivalent land capability? 
and are interested in too is some of the information that we learned from this project, can we apply it to the newer criteria? The criteria have evolved, as Tracy mentioned, but are there insights that we can share based on the information from our study? So the Ecological Recovery Monitoring Project first had to develop long-term, scientifically robust and financially sustainable, um, uh, uh, sorry, <laughs> uh, <clears throat> it says financially sustainable monitoring program for what reclaimed well pads was the goal, um, and then to extend that to other specified lands over time. The key was that we didn't want to bite off more than we could chew, so we want to start off relatively small scale. So we started off by focusing on well pads as a, you know, one hectare-ish uh, footprint, approximately 100 meters by 100 meters. And what we did is we looked at three different land types, which I'll talk to you in the next slide. And we were looking, as I said, back. So we did a retrospective study rather than temporally following sites over time. And as Tracy mentioned, right, the goal uh, in the past was like to conserve topsoil and get something growing. Um, whereas the newer criteria avoid the use of non-natives like the crusted wheatgrass. And it, it's not just about green being good, but rather the uh, species composition mattering. So we had to start off by developing monitoring protocols. So we had to figure out what we should actually measure and you'll see which um, attributes we picked. Um, this was done in conjunction with with Alberta Biodiversity Institute, with uh, researchers, with government and regulators um, as part of our advisory group to give us recommendations on this. And then to go out and test our protocols that we developed in sample ecosystems, starting in 2013 with native grasslands, in forested lands in 2014, and then cultivated lands in 2015. So what I'm gonna focus on in the project today is to focus on the native grasslands. Um, and we wanted to start out with something relatively simple, quote unquote, uh, more so because my background was more so forestry before that was to appreciate how easy it is to run a line and that you don't have to worry so much about bears, but it turns out you have to worry about cows. Uh, and they can actually have a lot of fun with your measuring tapes and uh, recapping, but uh, lots of learning happened along the way. So just to, to highlight too that we're interested in ecological recovery as opposed to equivalent land capability. Equivalent land capability is the government language that's used, but from a recovery perspective as an ecologist is like, how do you actually measure that? So the idea is that we want the biological, physical and chemical properties on the site to be similar to what those conditions would have been prior to it. So it's giving a way to better quantify um, that. So that's why you'll hear me talking about ecological recovery as opposed to uh, recovery to equivalent land capability. All right, so what did we actually measure? So we looked at, as I said, vegetation indicators and soil indicators. So the vegetation indicators we looked at were we had 0 0.5 by 0 0.5 or 0 0.25 meters squared quadrats. And these were systematically located on the well pad and in the adjacent reference area. And so we looked at vascular plants and non-vascular plants. We also did time censuses in each of the four quadrants on the well pad and in the adjacent reference area to get a sense of the, the richness as opposed to the relative abundance of the individual species. And then we calculated diversity measures, richness being how many species we have, and incorporating the composition, the relative abundance of those species using diversity measures such as the Shannon index and the Simpson index. And just a small note here, because Tracy's going to be talking about the rangeland health assessment in the 20, as part of the 2010 criteria. And so while we did capture uh, various elements of that, we didn't do a systematic full rangeland health assessment. So for instance, our litter estimates, we measured at LFH depth, but we didn't get any kinds of biomass estimates for litter. Okay, so then we measured soils and we wanted to err on the side of uh, not less is more, but more is more. Uh, and then we could go back and evaluate whether do we really need all of these going forward, but we wanted to try to be more, more exhaustive with this pilot project. So 108 samples per site uh, measured at four different depths. We couldn't do any kind of analysis at the horizon scale because the horizons get disturbed on the well pad. So rather we focused on specific depths that were systematic. And so we had four depths the, for the top two depths, that's where we could use our bulk density sampler, which you see in the lower left. So that's where we got our soil cores that we could measure bulk density on. And for the other two depths, the deeper ones, we used a soil auger. So we couldn't get bulk density estimates for those. But for all four depths, we did measure pH, electrical conductivity, 
organic carbon and total nitrogen. We did try to measure penetration resistance and ran into some issues with that. And we didn't have the expertise to do soil, um, soil mites, as that was something else we discussed potentially doing. Although in a future year in the cultivated lands, we did that. So people are interested about the biology, the biotic elements of the soils. That is something that we tried to try to explore, but also looking at the soil microbial community was something that we ideally would like to have done, but in terms of scaling up to a monitoring program, didn't seem like that was going to be feasible. So with these indicators in mind, we went and developed monitoring protocols using the same idea as Tracy talked about with the adjacent reference condition. Um, and note that our um, monitoring protocols very much build on the Alberta Biodiversity Monitoring Institute protocols. So um, they have very um, systematic locations for the, the placements of the plots, um, in our case on a well pad, and then in the adjacent reference area. So I'm not going to go into all the nitty gritty details of these, but you can access, we actually have the monitoring protocols published in the journal American Society of Mining and Reclamation. So you can check those out there or contact me for more information. Just wanted to talk a little bit. So we sampled 18 sites in the dry mixed grass region in 2013, focusing, trying to control as much variation as we could, recognizing the limitations of not knowing the historical history of these sites in terms of when they were reclaimed necessarily, was it right after uh, drilling or was it, there was a gap there. So we based our time period on the post date of certification. And so we looked at 12 uh, that were certified under the older regulations, ranging in age from 17 to 30 years post certification. And then we had six with the newer, um, newer reclamation criteria and those we sampled eight to 10 years post certification. So as I said, we tried to control variability. So we had public grazing lands, uh, low level loamy eco sites. And so that was to try to control variation as much as we could. So because we can't go in the field with you, uh, we can show you a little bit of a virtual field trip, if you will. So we can go look at our oldest sites and move a little bit forward. So here's an example where we have our well pad on the left and our reference on the right. And this is about 30 years post certification. So this would be the pre-1995 criteria. And while you won't necessarily recognize uh, the species here, right? We can sort of look from afar and say green is green is good here. But what you are looking at in the left there is a uh, crested bee grass. Here, 20 years post certification, again, well site on the left, reference on the right. What we can see here is again, uh, green and green, but that's why we took the detailed data and we can evaluate it so that uh, we can, a picture isn't necessarily worth as much as the, as the data are in this case. But on the left, you will see, for example, a lot of dandelion in the, in the foreground there. Uh, and finally, we can see again on the left, well site and reference. So this would be in the newer 1995 criteria. So what you're not seeing here is crested wheatgrass. So uh, I know that graphs can be a little bit overwhelming and uh, looking at a lot of results can get to be a sort of a headache. And so I'm just going to show you one graph here. And for those of you not familiar, what we're looking at here is an ordination plot, in particular, uh, non-metric multidimensional scaling plot. All you have to know here is that points closer together are more similar than points that are further apart. And what each of these points represents is the average uh, mean composition of all of the looking at the plant community as a whole. So rather than just focusing on an individual species, here we're interested in multivariate analysis where we're collectively looking at the plant community and the relative com composition of the species within each well pad and within each reference location. So the gray boxes on the right represent the reclaimed well pads that were reclaimed under the older criteria. And the blue triangles represent the well pads that were reclaimed under the newer criteria. And the black circles represent the reference, the adjacent references here. And so when we did analysis to look at the composition of the species on the well pads, what we found that they were different amongst all three of those groupings, but that you can see that the newer uh, reclamation criteria represent uh, species composition closer to what we see in the, in the reference. And in part, this is not at all surprising because of the historic practices, as Tracy mentioned, of the crested wheatgrass. So in terms of looking at the indicator species to see what is contributing to the patterns that we see here, crested wheatgrass is a big, big player here. 
whereas in the newer sites, it's Western wheatgrass and associated with the reference, so that's a native species, and associated with the reference are the needle and thread gra grass and the blue gramma grass. So my postdoctoral fellow, Dr. Randy Lupardis, took a look and said, okay, so we see differences in terms of species patterns, but what about the actual plant, plant traits? So this is a newer area of research that's so less focused on the species themselves, but more so on what traits those uh, species represent in the landscape where they are. And so what she did was classify using the traits of plants in Canada database, the various properties associated with the plant species that we found on the older and newer, newer well pads and the reference sites. And what she found was that for the older sites, they had very different traits, in particular introduced species, right? Um, high seeds production, animal dispersed, music preferences were some of the properties that she saw there and overall uh, lower functional diversity compared with, uh, with the reference conditions. Whereas with the, with the 10 year old or the younger sites, she found traits like tall, that they were tall, had a hydric preference, uh, lower dispersal capacity. So these also were, um, had, had native, native properties associated with them. And then references had a more of a zero preference, semi-abundant seed production, large seed weight. So there were different properties associated with the reference, um, even with the newer criteria, but that they were more similar and it does point towards their functional properties being more similar. And so less evidence to support potential for arrested succession, unlike what we saw with the, with the newer, uh, with the older sites rather. So there's a paper published by Dr. Lupardis um, in Ecological Engineering X, available open source if you wanna go take a look and see more information about this. But the point being that it's not just the species composition, it's not just about being non-native or native, but that the traits of the actual native species matter as well. So as I said, I didn't want to graph you to death here, but just to highlight some of the main findings here is the fact that we did see different soil properties and different vegetation properties on those well pads compared with in the adjacent reference area. Things like higher bulk density and electrical conductivity on the well sites, uh, lower species richness, diversity, and cover on the well pads, but with higher cover on the, of non-native vegetation on the well sites, more so in those older sites. So what we see in terms of our main take home message from this is that these well site legacies can be long lasting. So our studies only looked at sites up to about 30 years, but we still see evidence of, of uh, those long lasting impacts there. And based on what we're seeing with the newer results from the newer uh, reclamation criteria, that there's more, those potentially have less impact than the, the older ones, which is good because that means that the practices are evolving. And while I don't have time to talk about it too, just to note that we did do some aerial remote sensing as well using unmanned aerial, aerial vehicles, uh, drones. And so here on the left, you can see an aerial image of the well pad. And you can still see, this is one that was spotted in 1992, certified in 2001. And on the right, you see the spectral data, the vegetation cover, the green being the, the cover. And you can definitely see that there's evidence to support that you can still see that legacy effect. You can still see that footprint even, even this many decades after. So I've had the opportunity here to, to talk to you and just briefly introduce the long-term, this uh, potential for a long-term program. So we did a pilot program here, right? It's a start, it's definitely not a finish point. Uh, it helped us to really leverage the, uh, uh, a certain amount of funds to try to figure out what the best approach is and how to do things. We got way more efficient. We learned like, don't mess with the cows. Right? We learned that uh, you can be more efficient with your sampling as you learn how to do it. And we learned a lot of great ecological insights through, through this process. Our goal is for this to become a long-term monitoring program for the province to assess ecological recovery at well pads and then expand to other um, specified lands as well. And ideally to include the, the current reclamation criteria and to be able to follow sites over from time zero onwards and not have to try to go back looking in a binder from 40 years ago to figure out what happened. That can be really insightful and helpful for us to do that. Unfortunately, at this point, we don't have funding from, from the government to, um, for this to happen, but we are not giving up that uh, it couldn't still happen in the future. So with that, I'm gonna give Tracy the opportunity to tell you about now the criteria that were implemented beginning in 2010. So these are the criteria that uh, we did not look at in our study.
Thanks, Anne. So as Anne mentioned, it was recognized by industry and the government that the 1995 criteria needed to be updated, which, the, which Anne's project, the ERM project showed. So various stakeholders, landowner, industry, government, producer groups, including beef, crops, everyone came together in 1998 to 99 to build the most current 2010 criteria. Reclamation and the applicable criteria have progressed as a science in parallel, and that's key to, to keep in mind. I'll keep saying that over and over again, no matter where you are in the world, those, it's, it's not, they're not in silos. So they, you know, they're, everything's moving forward in, in parallel. And so they were moving forward with improvements in the construction practices, but what we use here is minimal disturbance. <laughs> so um, I'll explain minimal disturbance more later. The grassland criteria is it, their end goal for the grassland criteria is still equivalent land capability, but the parameters in the assessment methods to measure the ELC have become more specific and stringent. In the, the reclamation criteria theory for native grasslands is to establish a combination of reference and seral native plant species to set up the site on a positive successional pathway towards the desired plant community. Now, if you look at the picture above and you recall the pipeline photo that I had earlier of the crested wheatgrass scar across the prairie. If you think of that crested wheatgrass pipeline versus the one that you can see here in the photo, um, the pipeline in the photo was constructed using minimal uh, plow in. It wasn't, this was plowed in with a spider plow. It's a four inch tie in line. Um, it was, constructed in late fall when the plants were dormant and this is this is one year after the the pipeline was put in so you can see the silver arty fry or pasture sage artemisia frigida moving into the site which is which is a successional or pioneer species so this plant community here is on the trajectory to blend into the adjacent plant community within a few years versus that visible scar of the crested wheatgrass. Next. 2010 criteria under APIA, Environmental Protection Enhancement Act. I won't read this all to you because you can read for yourselves, but it was recognized on public, provincial public lands that grass is grass is grass that didn't, that didn't fly, it didn't cut it. So we went from crested wheatgrass to seeding the na native cultivars, which was often green needle grass, northern western wheatgrass, and stream bank wheatgrass or slender wheatgrass. And so it didn't match the offsite. It wasn't necessarily the same species as on as offsite. So the grassland criteria applies to the report I'll talk about here, the detailed site assessment now. Um, to how do you measure it? How do you know? what species are there. And so it is in the detailed site assessment report, which essentially is the report card, if you will, for the site. It, measure, it looks and uh, measures, I suppose, the soils, vegetation, and landscape on the well site. And they use it adjacent controls. It's conducted by an experienced professional reclamation practitioner. And the key is that the range man management tools there were range management tools incorporated into the rec cert criteria for grasslands. That is really important to note. So I just wanna to touch here on a little bit of history lesson. Speaking of long-term monitoring, <laughs> the Alberta rangeland research that we have in the province here began at 1-4 research station back in 1927, which is actually right close to the, to the Montana border, just straight north of Haver. And so that's 90 plus years of rangeland research that has been utilized to develop some really important tools for range management. Next. These tools are, next slide please. The tools here that you see are the range plant community guides for each natural subregion that I mentioned earlier throughout the province. These three books that you see here the, for the dry gra mixed grass, mixed grass and the foothills fescue, some examples of those books that we use which are essentially reference, um, they are plant community guides for the reference plant sites. And those are all based on ex, uh, exclosure sites that we have going back to the, the exclosure sites are back to the seventies and it uses a range management research from the twenties. So that's pretty long-term. Those books are now utilized during the detailed site assessment. 
Next. During the vegetation portion of the detailed site assessment, the, the uh, plant community guides are utilized to determine where that site is in, compared to, in comparison to the off-site um, controls, if you will, and the reference plant community for that specific plant community that the site is located in. So the key is that the grassland detailed site assessment utilizes science-based range management tools. So that's kind of a neat combination or correlation or incorporation, I guess you could say, of range management and reclamation for the grassland part of the province. This report card, the DSA, is, um, it shows that it helps to show the functionality of the site. So what are the species? What is the plant cover? What is the bare soil percent cover? Um, are there any weeds? Is there litter, the old grass left on site compared to off site? And it's used to determine whether a site meets the equivalent land capability because it is measuring it in comparison to the off site control. But again, the parameters and assessment methods to measure that equivalent land capability have become more specific and stringent based on this science, scientific foundation. So um, that's the science aspect of it. That, is really, really important. Why does this all matter? Why do we want to measure things and um, have a report card? And why do we, why does industry even, besides the fact that they're legislated, but why does it matter to them? Why, how do we get buy-in from industry? This photo here is an example of how, how we get buy-in from industry. This site that you're looking at is a shallow gas, minimal disturbance, well site, natural gas well site on, on native grasslands. So this site was built under frozen ground conditions one year prior to this photo. You can see there's hardly any impact there. So the cost savings for industry, they'll look at this site and say, oh my gosh, okay, to reclaim this site now, I've got a whole lot less area to, that has been disturbed. So the soils haven't been disturbed, your soil microbes and all the things that, that uh, Anne was measuring in her report, those haven't been disturbed. There may be some compaction, but the grasses and the vegetation and that soil, um, the prairie sod, if you will, the moss lichen layer that we have is still intact. So it's still considered intact, uh, in, intact prairie. The, that means that it's faster, technically, it could be faster and um, the minimal disturbance sites have a much higher and faster timeline, I guess to reach that certification goal. Then that also leads to happier landowners, which the cattle can graze right up to that well site, intact ecological landscapes. It's a win-win-win. Now, in comparison to full disturbance sites on grasslands where the soils have been pushed and moved and the vegetation has been disturbed, there's a higher cost to reach the end goals of the criteria in order to obtain a rec cert, which the rec cert is then that closure. Once they obtain the rec cert, that's the closure. That means they've achieved all the requirements and they it is done, it's closed. So their, I guess, liabilities are then reduced by obtaining that rec cert. I could get, that's a whole other presentation. I could get into that, <laughs> but I won't. Um, this is an example of, of collaboration. What you're seeing here is a multi oil well pad on dry mixed grass prairie. It's, an, it's another example of collaboration between numerous stakeholders. And the key to these sites of being minimal disturbance is communication between all the different groups through all the stages of development, including, if not most importantly, the planning aspect of it, the planning part of it, the pre disturbance of where when, how. Another example is, this is another shallow gas well site, coil tubing rig out in the distance, set back from this ephemeral wetland up higher, and it's in late fall that they're doing the operational work on it. You can see the 400 barrel tanks put off in the distance to hold any saline water or produced water. Um, it's, it's the planning, the logistics, so that when it comes to end of life, next picture, or slide, sorry. Um, at the end of life, if things are done well and, and thoroughly at the front end, that correlates directly to the success rate of the back end or, this, or the reclamation slash closure 
of that site. Here's another example of a minimal disturbance, shallow natural gas well. It's not level, they didn't strip any soils, they didn't push anything, they built it in winter and you can see the grass has been laid down just from driving on it and a little bit of impact here. But the, the important thing is that the prairie sod's still intact and with a little rain, it'll come back. And that is so important. So looking back on the foot past 40 years of reclamation, we've learned that planning is critical, where, when, and how, site location, time of construction, time of, type of equipment, construction methods, they're all keys. And so I just wanted to show you some of these examples. There are lots of examples of full disturbance still occurring on the grasslands, I'm not gonna lie, but these, I just wanted to show you some of the good news stories. Here's a really neat good news story, being a good neighbor, this um, industry client wanted to put a compressor station here. It's in a highly visible, highly um, high tourist area. The neighbors were out, just outraged that there would be a compressor station scar on their landscape. They got together, they worked it out, and this is what you're looking at now. This is actually a compressor station built to look like a farm. People drive by it on the highway all the time, don't even realize it's actually a compressor station. So if you challenge industry and the current thinking it's amazing what solutions industry can come up with it but it really it takes collaboration it takes communication and one thing I always like to throw in is this slide is it's so important that in reclamation we often want to just seed things down fertilize it get it growing fast and fix it fast and often we forget that on natural natural landscapes on native grasslands those processes are thousands of years of evolution have gone into building them and so we need to make sure that sometimes we need to take stock on what we do. Is it actually helping the process move or is it impeding it? So my favorite saying is less is more. And that's, that's where this slide is really important is when we're doing our planning or we're thinking about our reclamation plans or we're looking at research or anything is we need to think big picture. So we often talk about one well site one pipeline, we only do reclamation um, for pipelines or we only do reclamation for well sites. We need to look like step back and look at the 30,000 foot level and look down at the big picture to see where are their wins, where are their gaps, where can we work together with different people. So that takes me to this slide here. The importance of planning ahead, I think I've drilled that into everybody's head, but when we're planning, we also need to look back. We need to look in the rearview mirror and and look at being being site specific, but also look at the big picture and avert those unintended consequences, like for example, our crested wheatgrass scenario that we have up here. And I will say I do like crested wheatgrass and it has its purposes in a field by itself where you can manage it properly. So I just want to point that out. It's not a it's not evil, it just has created some really interesting challenges. The other thing that's important is the right fit. We need to make sure that we have the right fit. So clean equipment, the right equipment, good operators, people with the right experience. What timing are we doing our work? Are we using minimal disturbance practices? Can we minimize the amount of soil and prairie saw that is being disturbed? Do we need to cut the top of that hill off? Can we find some uh, self-leveling rigs that can, that can work in slightly all you know, uneven terrain? And then we also have to monitor the sites after for weeds and overall site recovery. And that thing about being a recipe is, this is my and Anne's recipe that we kind of come up with, but in the end on the grasslands, what we really need is rain and time, <laughs> which we can't control, unfortunately. Go ahead, Anne. Thanks. Yes, and another thing that is essential and what we've already hear, heard Tracy talking about is collaboration and cooperation among stakeholders. So, you know, we can see these pronghorn in the lower right here and think about the headbutting. Um, and that's traditionally, I think, the perspective that we think about like regulator and researcher, perhaps, or regulator and in industry. Um, and I think Tracy and I are really a great example of where uh, collaboration and cooperation is key. We were both invited to give this um, joint keynote, well now webinar, because we're, we're not able to come to you in person because of COVID. Um, but the fact that we can work together on this and learn from each other uh, is really, really key and a great model of that, I would say. Uh, another thing we need to do in terms of making sure, so we need the, the native spe species composition matters. So we also have to make sure that we have the right kinds of seed mixes to match the control. 
they just need to be clean seed mixes and that can be a real challenge to, to um, uh, find those at this point in time. And we also though wanna recognize that there is the serial evolution, right? There's a serial progression, successional trajectory that we wanna follow. So we can't just plant late successional species and expect that that's gonna work. So we have to be strategic in terms of putting in the ones that should start out and then um, that the pioneer species and then set the stage for there to be the seed presence in order to then have succession be able to happen. So it's not just about having a particular species, it's about having the right structure and function to support that positive successional trajectory back to what was there before. And that in large part starts with planting the, the right thing and doing all the right practices to begin with. So we're learning a lot. We've learned a lot through our project and there's lots of other great research activities that are going on. But we really, I think, need to continue to expand that research to better understand how the successional trajectories are going to um, move forward under the different reclamation practices in the past and in the current and continue to explore how best to measure them. And if there's more ways that we can be more efficient um, <clears throat> to do that then that would be great because of course time and money right are very challenging and Tracy will talk a little bit more about that coming up here but ideally we want to be measuring from time zero too you know if we could have like the pre-disturbance stuff and have it somewhere that's accessible that we can find it it's part of the challenge is that when we look back at some of our sites we couldn't actually find the information for them uh, in terms of their history so following these sites from time zero and then repeated measures over time is going to give us a lot a lot of great insights on, in terms of recovery patterns and so we want to continue to use science to inform the criteria. This does not come, though, without challenges for, for all of us. And Tracy, I'll tell you about those. Yeah, no, I think, well, Ann and I, we're, this is probably originally a five slides for this one, just the challenges. There's always going to be challenges. And I think that what we come up with is, like Ann said, it, we've learned a lot from each other. And also in the last 11 years, or even since 2013, when Ann started that project, there is a lot more um, information, readily available information now for a lot of other sites. So things again have progressed and evolved, but we we're, there's always room for improvement. And even the best laid plans, they have to be adaptable. So that is another challenge that we run into because the it's never black and white on what we do. We, we have a plan and then something happens and it, it changes. So in the grasslands there's many shades of brown essentially with not just the ecologically but even your funding your people the fact that you get a drought or you have a fire there's always something going on that's that's affecting your sites or your off sites and the the thing is what is good enough you know we what the lessons that we've learned again we can have plans but then how do we balance out those plans with the cycles that we're in so we have we have closure from a RECSERT perspective for industry that they have that report card and the criteria that they have to follow. But how do we do a, a research project that can be resilient and robust enough to withstand all the different cycles that it has to go through? So there's your one year funding cycle for grants, there's your two year grad school, grad student cycle, there's your four year political cycle that might impact your project, there's drought cycles, there's all these different cycles, but then how do you get something to actually measure the ecological cycle of a site? How do you make it resilient and robust enough to withstand all that? That's the magic question. That's, I think we spent hours talking about that. And we'll just, maybe just go to the next slide. Yeah. And, and, I, and yeah, go ahead. Oh yeah, and I would say, yeah, we, we don't have all the answers, right? We're still scratching the surface, but I think we appreciate the need for how flexible and adaptable frameworks have to be related to reclamation and to the research into it and to make sure that it recognizes that it's not a single snapshot in time that we need and that there's a moving target in terms of what our long-term goal here is and that we need to make sure that we're monitoring over the longer term to better understand this and always be inputting that new information. So rather than having a static point in time to keep going back and measuring and adapting and using science to inform policy uh, and to make sure that the message is getting from the researchers to the policymakers that um, to make sure that these these changes can uh, can be implemented and supported and working back and forth too right rather than being siloed so that's really really important yeah and in the end we'll always just do our best with the information that we have at that point in time that's that's really what that's all we can do is do the best you can with what you got. 
And that's something that, you know, when we talk about trajectory, that's the next question. Well, how do we know? And it's important to ask the questions, but it's just as important to look back and see, well, what have we already learned? What are the gaps? Maybe someone else already has some information we could use. So it's, it's been a great opportunity to, to learn and collaborate, but um, things are changing so fast that, I mean, this is a perfect example, webinars versus an actual <laughs> conference. Uh, yeah, this is a good example. But anyways, it's continuous improvement to sum it up. I think that's pretty much a wrap for me. I, I agree. Yeah, so thank you very much, Tracy. So th yeah, I really appreciate having the opportunity to do this presentation with Tracy. Thank you to to Brenda, to Miranda and Scott for, and the other reclamation organizers in North Dakota for hosting us. Yes. To all of the project team that's been involved in the RM. Uh, big shout out to Arnold Jans who just retired from Alberta Environment and Parks after a whole long career in the conservation and reclamation of well pads and really appreciate all that he's brought to this project as well as all the other project team members and most recently my postdoc, Dr. Randy Lepardis has been instrumental in terms of all the information she's found and the restoration of working landscape team members that have been involved in the in the functional traits stuff as well. And of course, our field career members and all of our funding sources. So really grateful for all of them and our partnership with um, Intertech Alberta has been also instrumental. They were the ones running the field teams. Okay. All right. The next one, Anne. Are you guys... Do you have another slide? Oops. Sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say thank you very much. Thanks, Brenda and, and Miranda and everybody for the invitation. Just everybody, uh, my old team, thank you, especially Kevin Ball, Corey Zadko, Ashley Easton, Darren Sherritt, Kevin Redden, and, and Karen Scott. Thanks so much for all your input and help. And yeah, thanks for the opportunity. Nice to talk to you guys. All right. Thank you, guys. Um, so we do have uh, some time for questions. It's my understanding that we can go after the top of the hour a little bit. So uh, if people need to leave, they can. And if not, uh, we'll stay here for a few more minutes and answer questions. So I will, uh, in the, in the Q&A, uh, Tom had a question. What is your standard treatments for soils, amendments, conditioners, fertilizer, Etc. on these pads and how was the treatment process or how has the treatment process changed over the last 10 years? I think that would be, if anything, a question for Tracy because I'm only dealing with them after they've received the reclamation certificate. So, uh, and that's the catch. We don't often know all of the information in terms of the history. That would be really meaningful to know, but that ends up getting lumped in into all of the, the site level effects that we analyze in our study. So I don't know, Tracy, because you also deal with them after after they've been reclaimed. Do, do you have any more well, insights? I did in my old job. Um, so I guess amendments essentially on, on grasslands, on public lands are not allowed. They, the fertilizer has been found to actually set back the native species because the grasslands evolved in a nutrient and moisture challenged environment. Um, it's, the key is to not disturb as much as possible. I see there's another, there's another point that I didn't make is that when there are sites that have to have 24, 24 seven access, like our oil sites that need full bill roads or more um, supported roles, I guess we've used two track trails. So we've put gravel in the tire tracks to support the the weight and the equipment and really if it's pouring rain you don't go out there and the sites that have to have access 24 7 for for example to pull product out from from well sites from oil um, 400 barrel tanks for example when they got to have tanker trucks go in there those roads do have full builds they do have special approvals to build full gravel roads to get in and out so I was, I was showing you pictures that I have taken. Those are all my own personal pictures. I'm sure if I was to go into the database, I could find all kinds of examples of full build roads, um, teardrops, uh, full access sites. Uh, there's, you know, there, the key is, the key is planning from the outset. So the old sites that needed 24 seven access they, yeah, you don't want equipment getting stuck or sinking to their axles or, you know, rutting things up. So, 
that's where we would have a, a gravel road built to those sites. I don't know if that answered that question, but I seen another question in the chat box that distracted me. <laughs> Good, I'm glad you addressed that. Um, so a couple of people have asked about co uh, compaction issues uh, mm -hmm. and what do you do to relieve compaction? Well, that's the key is the, it all goes back to the site. Um, what's the level of, uh, of access or what level of disturbance is required for these sites. So like I mentioned before, the oil sites that need full access, they'll have roads. Um, compaction on prairie, what, what I've found personally is that if that moss lichen layer is, is present and the vegetation is present, even if it is compacted, it will continue, it will come back. And the, the key is to not cut through that with tires. So that's where the two track trails of two, the entire tracks basically of gravel laid on top of the prairie soil. Once that road was stopped, once the use stops of that road, the grass in between the tire tracks is essentially a seed source. It will come back up through the grass. So we're not as, I haven't seen, I haven't been as concerned about compaction. If you think about historically, we've had, you know, really historically, you've got millions of bison going through the countryside. The vegetation can handle it. It's the moss lichen layer that we have in Alberta that we deem true native prairie. And I know there's a difference of opinion when you go south of the border with my friends from Montana and North Dakota. So it's a little bit different soil types and it is different plant community types that you have in North Dakota. So I would just encourage you to go back to your site specific, go back to your site of where you're working and look off site and see. So some things that have been done for compaction, relieving compaction has been um, Rotos picking or uh, paratilling with just in the tire tracks. But the main thing on the grasslands is it's recognized the main thing to protect now is vegetation more so than the soils. If your vegetation is present and your soils haven't been disturbed, um, then it will heal, it will come back. It's just that we have topsoil that's maybe, maybe six inches max down here, not even. We have places where there's an inch of topsoil. So it's maintaining the vegetation that we can't reestablish. Okay. All right. Uh, that is it for the Q and A in the, in the, um, the zoom, but I have a question for you since we'll go a couple minutes long. Um, your land uses are basically uh, domestic livestock and wildlife. Is that true on the grasslands? Uh, livestock, Recreation, so hunting, and we're on, on provincial public lands. Yeah, that's predominantly it. Okay. Do you have a vegetation diversity criteria that needs to be met as part of that as part of that certification? The biodiver, like so, the species composition. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's part of the detailed site assessment vegetation portion. The vegetation portion of the detailed site assessment and. That's the, the comparison uh, is offsite as well as using your plant community guides. Those are those range management guides that I showed you in the one slide there um, that are for the different natural subregions. So you can go to, uh, for example, if you are on a site that has, uh, that is based on the soils and the terrain, we have determined plant communities for the entire natural subregion. So they all have codes. And the code base is based on vegetation reference species, soil type, and um, terrain. So is it a blowout site? Is it a loamy site? Is it a sandy site? And so on. So that will tell you what your reference is, what your criteria of where you want to get to. Whatever, um, what did you call it, Brenda? A diversity, diversity criteria. Yeah. So essentially that is, that is giving you your guide of what your criteria is for that okay. plant community. Okay, uh, one last question, um, maybe for Anne on this one. If money wasn't an issue, what, uh, what gaps in research would you fill? 
Oh gosh. <laughs> <laughs> well, I feel like we'd, we'd, we'd explore a whole broader suite of indicators, for instance. We do a whole bunch more sites, right? So ideally, like if we could look at the microbial community in more depth, right, is like a relative composition of bacteria and fungi. Uh, if we could look at the, the mite communities, right, what kind of invertebrates do we have in the soils and is that affecting what we see there? And I think just the intensifying the sampling and uh, yeah, and then looking over time, right? basically to better have a better understanding across a much diverser landscape, uh, the, the patterns of succession that we get to observe under the different criteria. So for instance, we pick loamy ecosites, public grazing lands, right? That story is gonna be different if we're on undulating terrain, if we're on a different ecosite, right? If we're on a different soil, right? If we're on a solanetic soil or something, right? Like every, every there's so much variation there. So, so yeah, right. that would and, be challenging. And and sites were all full stripped. So all the soils were pushed in those on those sites. So there there is definitely admixing and there is soils that have been impacted because of that construction practice of the time. And so the thing to like for research, if I could add to that too, a little bit is is this trajectory thing actually working? Is it helping or is it being we are seeing changes in species composition with changes in, in rain patterns and and climate change if you will we'll use that scary word but we are seeing a drying of uh, a drier conditions and so longer timelines to actually allow for natural recovery or to allow for uh, species to establish successfully so the the thing is uh, you know when somebody asked about compaction if I could add back to that the compaction thing that we have is or a, um, a stopgap, if you will, is on crown lands, on public lands, you only work in dry or frozen conditions. So if it's wet, you don't work, you shut down. And that is really expensive for a company. So they don't operate until they get to the dry months when it probably won't rain at, or winter months when it's frozen. So dry or frozen conditions is, is the goal. That is the condition of their approval has a reduction in compaction and stuff so it's the planning it's the conditions it's the policies and everything to support it for those end goals is okay. that working i don't know that's Anne's. that'll Anne will answer that in a few years <laughs> okay um, if someone gives me money to do that <laughs> i don't believe there are any more questions so any last comments from you guys before we go just thank you very much again for the opportunity to present so hopefully somebody uh, everybody gained something from this Thank you. Okay. And if there's any questions, Anne had our, um, our emails on that last slide there. So yeah. um, happy to help or answer, talk, whatever. Okay. Shout out. Exactly. And that Thank is you. a great, that is a great reminder that the recording will be available uh, on this presentation. And again, a reminder for next week, uh, we will be talking about pipeline reclamation. So with that, I thank you, ladies. I'm sure our paths will cross again. So uh, sure thank, they you will. thank you to all the participants. You bet. Take thank care. you. Bye, everyone. Bye, everyone.